Because I go to court supporting young people, compliance of young people to jump on the Webex to get into court sometimes has been a challenge. So what we have been doing is uh, prior to court would be sending the link over and over. But also sometimes when the young person is in front of the magistrate, they can see a physical person. It is something that they can think of it over and over. Whilst the, um, just online, it's like, oh yes, he's saying about this, oh yeah, it ends like that. So I have seen the two sides of being in the actual court before COVID and now online, it's a bit different, but we have got no choice. And another advantage, which is not a challenge, I have seen women now attending court uh, through uh, the online because they have the link. You just have to send the link over the phone and then they will appear in court supporting their child. So I've answered both ways, sorry. Yeah, I can add to Selva's, um, I guess, take on it. And it's, it's difficult because you know, with services stopping and starting, programs stopping and starting, it creates a, a lot of disruption for the young people. Um, and I think uh, a lot of a lot of us who work in the youth phase, youth phase, are really used to being able to do outreach, and, and you get better engagement that way with young people when you are actually doing stuff with them. But obviously, that's not really possible with the pandemic. Um, on the flip side, it's not all bad um, because some young people do find it more comfortable for them to be engaging with services online. Um, you know, they are often very tech savvy, so it's, it's not really a problem for them. Um, but also, I think, you know, sometimes an in-person appointment, particularly if you access it in service within the justice system, um, it can be really intimidating. So, you know, a phone call, Zoom appointment might be kind of one step more removed for them um, and, and they felt less, I guess, overwhelmed um, as opposed to kind of in-person appointments. So that there's, there's challenges, but there's also people who, who finds it easier to engage through a different platform. And it's opened a lot of, I guess, options for us where, you know, in, in the past, I think the court and court related services are often insistent on in-person attendance, but we now realize that, you know, we've got to change with the times. I am aware for the programs we do have, yes, but um, yes, yeah, since um, there was a recent um, discussion in our um, meetings that apparently um, for um, the STAR soccer program, it was going to be um, closed due to um, funding and uh, because of COVID happening, a lot of kids can't be outside and active. So that was another, you know, um, activity that was taken away from them, sadly. But um, let's see. Um, yeah, and yeah, we are trying um, with um, Toyan, he's the leader of the Youth Ambassadors. Um, he's, um, you know, trying to, um, you know, speak to um, the city of Yara and see if there's anything they can do about helping um, the young people with um, the obvious programs they can't engage in right now um, physically, since a lot of those activities involve them being physically present and us helping them out and them, you know, playing outside and engaging with others. Um, we are trying to see if there's something we can do about them there. In regards to the relationship between young people of color and the police, um, like I mentioned earlier, it is a very um, tough and soft subject. Um, there's no right or wrong answer to that because everyone's got um, different experiences. Everyone has different traumatic um, events they've experienced with the police and everyone has a certain um, a, you know, level of trust they can um, give out towards you know, trying to see if they can mend that relationship. I think it just, 
it really all depends on um, if um, it really comes down to wanting to mend that relationship. Because I know some young people who do say they want um, to mend that relationship with police, but they don't really want to go out of their way um, to put that first step forward and see if they can do something about it. Because um, it's mostly um, based um, due to their fear of um, because they've seen so many and so much injustice um, towards young people of color that it's understandable for them to be hesitant about mending that relationship. But if it was up to me, like I mentioned, it's a two way street. I think it would be a good idea if um, most of the young people who've had bad experience with police got to know the police who have done good and who are trying to, um, you know, mend that relationship. If they could actually get together and sort of see if they can exchange ideas, talk to each other, because sometimes a good conversation is all that you really need. There's not much you need to do about that except just have a good talk, you know? Um, if young people got to see um, the point of view from um, the good police who are trying to see if there's anything they can do about it, um, and if they can also see the point of view from young people who've had bad experiences and try to understand that it is not going to happen in a day, you know, it's not going to happen in a week or not even a year. You know, this has been going on for a really long time and it's all about taking that first step. Um, people shouldn't expect it to mend overnight, but as long as people are willing to actually mend that relationship, then there is hope for them to actually move on and try to see if there's something they can build from that. So, yeah. I just wanted to say that um, in 20, 2018, 2019, we had a program with police headquarters, African Australian Community Task Force. And through that, every quarter, some African leaders, we go to police academy. So the police sergeants all over Victoria, we go and educate them about what African people are facing, especially the young people. I have had officers who were telling me that this is the first time that I can hear the challenges that they are facing because we, we tell them about the history, the challenges that I have said, why young people do what they do. So I think there will be some work with the police. I can't say much, but I think there's something in the pipeline whereby the police will be working with people of color. When that time comes, Monica, I'll beg on you and say, you know what, this is time when we can actually uh, work together to help the young people. So the police, they know, they are willing, they want to help. Well, first of all, I think it's good for youths to actually know what their rights are, because I know a lot of young people who actually don't know um, the laws very well, and a lot of them don't actually know what their rights are, because sometimes they've had um, experiences when police come up to them and um, they could um, unlawfully, like, you know, pat them down without their consent. And a lot of young people don't actually know what their rights are, and they do have rights that they need to um, educate themselves on. So in regards to that question, I think it's good for young people to actually be educated on their rights, first of all, before they can actually be helped in the system, because if they know their rights, they're feel confident and they feel um, they can actually go into a courtroom and actually speak um, very well um, to the courts and actually know what they're talking about and know what to expect because uh, most of them are blindsided if, um, if they actually are dealing with a certain situation like that and they don't really know how to deal with those situations and I've had a lot of them um, I've had a lot of them actually um, mention that they're, they're actually afraid of um, going to a courtroom because they don't know what to expect. They don't know what's going to happen to them. So I think it's a good idea to help them if there are programs in place. There are actually programs in place for young people to be educated on their rights. And there are legal systems and people out there who can help them like, you know, lawyers. Um, I think there was a... Um, I forgot the name, but it was a um, it was a free um, law um, adversary group at the time. I 
vaguely can't remember it because my brother had to go through them um, a few years ago. But yeah, they were able to help him out in the legal aspects of things. And they were able to tell him how it was going because sometimes for young people, when they get lawyers, um, you know, they just go into the courtroom and um, the lawyers tell them what to do, what not to do, what to say, what not to say. But as for that program, they actually told my brother what to expect and um, what the, um, what the, um, what the crime was committed and what um, the outcome was going to be and they detailed and explained to him how they were going to go about it and what the worst possible possible outcome was going to be and what the best outcome could be so i think it's a good idea for young people to know all those um all that information and it could really help them in the long run so yeah it's also the responsibility of the court like i think um, part of why the young analyst was um, developed was because there's a recognition that often young people come into the court and they feel like they're not part of the matter. Like people in the courtroom are talking about them, but they have no say and no choice and no expectation to participate in it. Um, and so the court needs to recognise that, you know, they're making decisions about someone's lives and this person needs to be able to be empowered to to advocate for themselves about what they need um, and so changing about the way we use language in the court and changing the way um, I guess the the parties in the court and how they interact with the young person um, it's really important um, you know so I guess police also need to recognise that they, they also play a role in influencing how the person will, the young person can, will perceive their, um, I guess, what the outcome of the court case means and, and um, the police ha has the ability to influence um, how the young person perceives um, what actually happened in court. And, um, so yeah, like it, it needs to be an all party uh, effort. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, obviously there's going to be a lot of challenges in terms of changing the way the court runs. Um, but you know, I guess the pandemic has given us some hope. The fact that you know that we've moved to an online space in in the in a really short time period let us know that like, the court is actually capable of changing um, but it just requires a lot of potential external push to do that well i'll just add by saying young people sometimes monica has already said it all but they don't know about their rights it's to find a lawyer who will dig into the history of that young person involve their parents the parents need to know also what their rights are there are so many kids are in jail today because there is no address where they can be uh, bailed out to what if the parent would have known that by just saying yes they can come home and not being ashamed that the child has been in, had been in jail young people would not um, um, stay in jail for a long time so there has to be more education on the rights some of these young people are going to jail for small small things but if they had known that their right was there, they had to do it in this indifferently, they wouldn't have been in jail. So I guess it's about working collaboratively, police, people in justice, but also the community. In doing so, knowing the issues, we are going to resolve so many problems that are affecting young people. I always say they are youth, they are leaders of tomorrow. What will happen? when us the dinosaurs go will they be continue to build jail after jail let us help them if we are indeed wanting to help them thank you